Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Excellent. Did my little outline make sense? Oh uh, yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm good with it. Um, so I'm ready for for all the different uh, for all the different stuff. Um, the I've got a lot of quotes and um, and I've got some I've got some tactical considerations that I have uh, that I have ready. So I'll show you. I'll share my screen right now. So so you can um, so you can see it. So let's see. Share screen. And let's go with this one. Oh, I should share. Screen. And uh, so you can see right here, I've got um, the reaction times to stimuli right oh, here. Nice. And then um, I'm going to kind of wrap, wrap, use this as kind of part of my wrap up about like kind of big takeaways besides when we just talk about taking what's in the text and going to going to uh to what you do you know hey you know you're you're fencing somebody what do you do now uh how do you make this work and then these are some things that i'm using to compose my thoughts about um once we get once we get away from hey fabra says don't do this right some masters don't agree with him these are some physiological and strategic things that can interface with that so that's that's how and I'll just say you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I've got uh, so we have more people. All right. So I might get you to control the um, slides when I'm talking if it gets to. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be ready to do that because I'm not sure if you'll be able to, to share them. But uh, and admit more people. So I'm going to see if it does right now. OK. No, you've disabled it, so I'll let you control right. that. Hi, Ilo. Hi, to Hi, Turlock. Hey, what's up? How's it going? All right. I'll get my camera on in just a second. It's all good. You, you don't need to if you don't want to. You can be. You can be. Uh, you can be text on a screen. That's oh no 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 no. Anybody else? In this? You're gonna be. Talking. You're gonna be that guy if you know. No, everybody else has got to deal with this ugly. You guys got to too. Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. Let's see. I did clear a bit of bit a uh, bit of space in the living room. Uh, I didn't know what this was going to uh, turn into, so it's it's mostly going to have some space for lunches it's, and things. It's mostly going to be discussion. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Because a lot of this has okay. to do with a lot of this has to do with like blade engagement. So you know, if you're, it's really more stuff to take away. And uh, and I would definitely get some notes though, get a notepad and some and, and uh, yeah. I think we're following this. I'll post the uh, I'll post our documents to the uh, to the event page so people can so people can uh, download those documents from the uh, event page. So you'll have our notes. And okay. uh, typically I like to uh, upload my, uh, my videos to YouTube. Um, so we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm down with that. Okay. And Lloyd's here. Howdy Lloyd. He's, he's just joining. Oh, now he's here. Oh, he's going to be sneaking around in the background. <laughs> Fine, be that way, Lloyd. Aha. Can't hear you. You're he's muted. muted. I had the wrong webcam configured. I'm not, not rigged up with the full OBS super switching capability that I do when I'm teaching. <laughs> Such a slacker. Well, if you want me to do be doing fancy screen mod switches and distracting from what you're talking about, I can do that. No, I just have to give you a hard time. That's how that goes. Uh, you're actually set up this time as opposed to Sunday where you were passing around uh, a cell phone to participate in, <laughs> in my class. I mean, now I'm teaching the class as opposed to taking it where I'm doing other stuff. Hey. Hey, Wendy. Yay, more people. 
Yeah. So let yeah, I have all of your uh, all of your documents downloaded. So if uh, so, I can share the screen um, if you want to, unless you want to just like talk and I can. Uh, either way. Yeah, it's it's just for the slide one. So yeah, that would be great when it's when it's time. Okay. And I'll just be like, cue slide. I just have the two word documents. You don't have the slides. Oh, maybe did you email them to me? Uh, oh yeah, there documented. I go. Yeah, I see. Cool. I see it now. All right. Yeah, the word documents I don't want to share, just the slides. Okay, I got them. Those right. were just notes. All right. Yeah, I'll be able to. I will. Uh, I will be able to uh, share that screen when we're ready for it with it. Awesome. Perfect. How you doing, Lloyd? Doing good. Thought I'd distract you with some Facebook chat right before your class. <laughs> You're so kind. I'm there we fine. go. We'll have some good stuff to uh, to talk about here. So I think I think you'll be happy with uh, some of the fun things we're we're gonna go over. have a marguerite mm -hmm. All right, i think we're probably going to start at uh at uh, 11.30, I've got 11.28 right now, mm -hmm. so. Maybe like 11.31 to give the last minute stragglers <laughs> who are like, oh gosh, internet. We're SCA people, we're totally on top of all of our stuff. Mm, have you met SCA people? <laughs> He's clearly from some other kingdom. <laughs> we don't day yeah. drink, we don't, we're not hot messes. Hey, you're lucky I'm up. This is my day, day off as a federal employee. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, I think the uh, the DOD civilians don't have tomorrow off, actually, though. Uh, yeah, it's Marguerite. We, have, we only have today off. Yeah. Fun stuff, but when you don't have the uh, when you don't have the the uh, green suitors there, then it's an easier day anyway because we're not all up in your business as much. Maybe I'm not sure if it's that way for engineers. Uh, my office doesn't re is well. My installation is almost all engineers, so that's what it is. Oh, okay. All right, We're getting a pretty healthy class so far. Healthier by the minute. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Morning. Hey. Thanks, Robin. All right. One more minute, uh, Latia. Mm -hmm. All right. Especially since we're still having people click in. Yeah. And I personally like being able to see if people are like nodding along and such. So mm -hmm. if you feel comfortable turning on your screens, that's awesome. If you're not, I'm not going to judge you just from a, if that's in your wheelhouse of comfort. And if not, that's cool too. If you're still in your jammies, I totally understand leaving your screen off. <laughs> All right, let's see, it's uh, 11.31, you, uh, you wanna lead off? Yeah, so we are looking at Fabris and one of the main points that he'll make throughout his text is that it is not good to touch your opponent's blade, like ever, ever, never. 
um, I don't know if he actually says never ever, but um, one of the first quotes in chapter four, which is so starting- I'm sharing my screen so you can, so y'all can see it. Um, which starts to get into um, the meat of what he's talking about with blade control is forming a counter posture means situating the body and the sword in such a way that without touching the opponent's blade, the straight line between the opponent's point and your body is completely defended. Um, so a lot of people try to use blade control. They feel like you have to touch to be in control and defended. Um, but clearly he states that that is not the case. Um, and then in the next slide, he goes on to literate, to um, talk more about that in his finding the sword section. So this was in counter postures. Um, so we're gonna go on to the next, next slide. Um, excellent. Um, and it's important to remember that uh, as you find your opponent's sword, you should never touch his blade. And he goes on in that same chapter about finding the sword that most of the time, if the opponent's sword is not molested, he will not realize that you have found it. So he talks about why it's important not to touch the blade as well as all these statements of not. And I feel like the first thing you have to understand if you're looking at what does defending yourself against the blade and what does strength of the blade mean is actually looking at his other definitions of strength of the blade in order to understand that before you can go in why you can why you can do that without touching the blade. So I've got some butter knives here. I've got team purple and team green. And we're going to talk about strength of the blade really quickly just so we're on all the same page. I typically do strength of the blade as kind of a overall class of there are four main ways to find strength of your opponent. And as I talk about these, you'll see how they work regardless of if the blades are touching. So the number one way I talk about it is, um, and most of these have references in Fabris either directly in his beginning section uh, where he'll talk about Fort and Foible and the like, or um, he talks about it in the plate. So one of the main ones is being on top of your opponent's blade because you naturally have gravity that can help you with any motion you're doing. So any time you are on top, that is one form of strength that you can use against your opponent. Uh, the other one he talks about, and the, I think this is in his second chapter, he starts talking about Fort and Foible, and that is how deep you are into your opponent's sword. Most of you probably already understand this concept, but the, the further closer you are to your hand, he breaks the sword up into four parts. And the part closest to your hand is going to be the strongest defensive part. So it doesn't matter. We're going to take those two parts. It doesn't matter if I'm on top of the blade. It doesn't matter if I'm touching the blade. Um, gravity still works regardless of if it's touching or not, right? Like I still have that force pulling down on my sword or pushing up. The same with the fort versus the foible. If my strong of my edge is here, I don't have to touch it. For that strength to count, I just have to have it there because that that point of contact, while it's invisible, while it does, we're not actually contacting, it's got the same properties of strength of the fort and foible, regardless of if it's touching or not. Um, the other uh, points that he makes is that um, I'm forgetting one it's totally randomly. Oh, the, the, the strong edge versus the weak edge. You've got the same thing. What, as long as you've got the strength there, it doesn't matter if you're actively fighting with the blade or if your positioning is there. It, the positioning is what matters. It's not the actual contact. And in fact, it's just as strong and you can hold that positioning better if you're not contacted. And I don't know if you guys can see the positioning of of the swords well enough from this. Um, and at this point, it might help to go into my screen instead of the quote, possibly. Um, so, and then the fourth way, and this is the one he um, says in the beginning, kind of intro chapters, is the, the blade is strongest in the direction that it points. And that strength, again, it 
it exists by the virtue of its positioning and not by connecting with the sword. And so when the sword is strongest in the position, it points. If I point towards the outside here, my blade, my blade is strongest in this direction. So if I'm 180 degrees here, boop, I turn it out. I'm strongest in this direction. So if I'm on this side, I'm weaker. If I'm on this side, I'm stronger because I'm pointing, if I am purple, I am pointing in the outside direction. If I'm here, I'm the, pointing in the outside direction and that's the direction my blade is strongest in. And it doesn't matter if I'm connecting or not, I've gained that strength by the virtue of where my sword is because this sword has to connect in the same place regardless of if it's touching or not. Do I have any questions so far on that? Nope. Excellent. Um, so that was the quickest I've ever gone through that. Um, so uh, there are also some, um, some different advantages with how your positioning works. And I think Julian was gonna go into the defense positionings. Yeah. So uh, let's see, I'll go back to my screen. So stop share. Yeah, all right. So um, as you can see me, um, basically there are three, when we're talking about disengages and uh, the whole, one of the big ideas behind all this and Letia has already been kind of alluding to this is that I am creating a counter posture, which is how most masters who are related to Fabris um, and Fabris uh, at times frame the idea of what of what um, what the whole point of all of this is. It's a counter posture. I'm creating a counter posture, a counter guard to um, to my opponent. I'm and the idea is that I am denying them a straight line to me. And the I and um, what I'm doing then the whole the strategic kind of so what of that is that um, I want to then prompt a predictable action of theirs, a predictable action in response to my counter guard. So um, that goes into disengages. And, uh, and this is what I'm going to get at right now. My brief point is uh, that there are three ways uh, of understanding, at least in some, in some people's interpretation, uh, that I'm blatantly ripping off from, uh, from a school that I went to with Robin uh, framing, framing this. Is, uh, is that there are three ways of kind of making those disengages a little bit more difficult. Um, so basically, there's, there's uh, depth of engagement, there's, there's angle of engagement, but what we're talking about here that really frames into uh, the idea of not touching is uh, the distance of engagement. So if I have, if I have, this is someone's one person's sword and I'm gonna get a little bit higher so you have my, uh, my, my shirt as a uh, as kind of a nice white background. So uh, this is one person's sword. This is another person's sword, right? And if black is trying to make it more difficult for red to disengage around it to create a bigger disengage, you know, they're they've got that uh, they've got that that counter guard. Um, if I have a closer distance to them, they have a much. They have a little bit of a less less space. To get around. However, if I have a little bit more distance over them, then they have then correspondingly more space to get around that blade. Now, this is something that um, not all masters really like to really like to say about creating more space between your opponent's blade, because when um, you know, further getting away from your opponent's blade can take, can, you know, has to be done very with a lot of, um, how I put it, caution, because uh, you can, if you get too far away from your opponent's blade, you will lose the structure and maybe even lose the control or the, or you might not, you might no longer be denying that angle of their, uh, of their, um, you might no longer be denying that straight line to you. But if you do, with a certain degree of judgment, if you have that nice gain and you can create just a little bit more distance 
uh, between their blade and yours while still keeping that gain strong, it gives you more time that they have to disengage around that blade versus being closer to it. So that's uh, that's one little additional insight that I can add to that. But uh, uh, Letia, I think I'll hand it back over to you now for the next part. Awesome. Should I go back to the slides? Uh, no, not yet. But okay. I will give you a thumbs up when it's time. Um, so the other thing talking with uh, both what Julian said and the before strengths of the blade, um, when I was saying you had to cross through a blade to still get to your opponent, I'm going to, I'm going to find something to be my opponent real quick. Um, hopefully we can see on screen. Nope. Water bottle. Water bottle is the opponent. Um, because I, I know you guys have probably seen the people that fight with their blades further down or further out of measure um, and that it's impossible to touch. That's not going to show up well. Sorry. Screens are hard, guys. Screens are really hard. So my hand's just going to be our opponent here. And you'll have people that come and will try to take their swords out of presence. Um, you can still use all of these strengths and block that line that they have to pass through in order to get to you. I can't hit here if I have to pass through here because my sword is out of presence. And that works on a smaller micro scale as well. Um, so anytime you have to reach your opponent, you actually have to cross through wherever you've positioned that strength of sword. So as Julian was saying, that distance creates more distance they have to go around, but also the distance of your strength. You always have to, the sword stays there regardless of if it's touched. So passing through it is a connection um, that has to be made and you can't, you can't stop physics, it's a solid object. Um, so knowing where that line goes through and where your strength is through that entire line can prevent the touch even, you know, especially when people aren't fighting against it. Um, and that's when we're gonna go to the next slide because there's other reasons not to touch a blade not just that you need to. So that would be slide three. So Fabris does say in chapter nine about if you touch the opponent's sword, uh, you somewhat disrupt your own form. And if you want the advantage of a sudden tempo, you could not because your sword is bound by the pressure of the opponent's blade and my cat. Um, cat, come on. Um, even if you merely rest your sword over the opponent's blade and he performs a quatione, you cannot prevent your point, point from falling slightly, which is enough to make you miss a tempo. So what that's talking about, or my interpretation of what that's talking about, is if I've got pressure on pressure against this blade and I'm purple and green is my opponent and I've got just a little bit of pressure as soon as green releases to do something, I'm gonna fall out, even if it's just the barely, barest amount of pressure, that release of tension is gonna drop my blade away because I'm already putting outward pressure where his blade is. So it's gonna let my blade fall down. I'm gonna try this angle to see if it is any different. So if I'm pushing, I move, that blade's gonna kick out because there's pressure against it. So when you're touching an opponent's blade, if you have a really strong angle, you can lose that angle because you're giving it away to your opponent. You're giving him the pressure that's holding and maintaining that space. Does that make sense to everybody? Sweet. Um, so, um, you know, that, that also can give away your positioning it can give away what you're about to do. If they feel pressure against your blade, it can give away as well. So I um, think that was my main, my main point with talking about the pressures and whatnot. And Julian has some interesting facts about sensing that and, um, and how fast you can react. Yeah, all right. So, uh, so I'm gonna bring up a couple slides over here that uh, to where we can talk about this. All right, so um, in modern, um, in kind of our modern, you know, studies, 
Uh, there's lots of people who have studied uh, and lots of institutions that have studied reaction times based on different um, on different um, senses. So you've got, as far as what we're talking about here, you know, we're not talking about taste really, uh, but we are talking about sound, touch, and sight. Okay, so um, this is coming from almost all studies generally agree that uh, that your auditory um, reaction time is the fastest. You you react the fastest to sound. Um, then touch is very close behind that. And then sight is is um, depending on 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 the study, it's either very significantly uh, slower than touch, or it's or it's a little bit slower than touch. But pretty much every study out there, at least all ones that I found, agree that your sent your that your vision your visual reaction time is slower than your sense of touch, and that is a big part of what interfaces into. Um, into maybe why these masters framed a lot of these masters, and we'll talk more about the, the other masters uh, in just a second, uh, but about why they favor the uh, not touching. And we'll go to the next slide for that. Okay, so these are some tactical considerations, and we'll go more into this in just a second, but the whole idea is that touch, your touch reaction time is faster than your visual reaction time, and that can work to your advantage and to your disadvantage. Now, um, those of you who are familiar with Fabris know that Fabris is generally um, a bigger advocate of offensive actions. That you are the that you are the one who is who is controlling the fight. That you are that you that your opponent is reacting to you. Uh, that being said, he talks a lot about how to react, but you can see the next the bottom series of bullets that um, basically I can use this to my advantage and to my disadvantage. If I am on the offense, uh, my opponent will be reacting slower to me because of those reaction times if I deny them a touch reaction. If I deny them the sense of touch, they will be relying on reacting to me visually, which is slower. Um, however, I can use that also to my advantage if I'm on the defensive, where um, if I am initiating the action. Uh, so if I'm initiating the action, sometimes there's a case to be made that uh, denying the sense of touch is favorable. If I am, however, reacting to my opponents, there is, from a strictly scientific perspective, I am going to be able to detect that change in the pressure on those blades quicker um, just because my neurons fire faster. Um, and if you're a human being, your, your neurons also fire, fire faster when reacting to a sense of touch. So um, that's just some general overview of how senses, how your senses can interface with this and how maybe you can compose your reactions, um, compose your tactics uh, based, based on, on choosing a sense on choosing to touch or choosing not to touch my opponent's blade and why. So um, I think I'll give this back over to Latia real quick, and then we'll uh, we'll go back and in, we'll go into um, different uh, what diff what other masters say, including ones in Fabris's lineage. So excellent. Um... So the last quote I have for you guys, um, there's actually two quotes um, that I found in the second book, um, more in the proceeding with resolution part of Fabris, um, where he kind of less directly talks about not touching the blade, but still um, shows how it's important throughout all of his types of, uh, through his entire system. And one is that the strength of the sword should be a function, and that says pavement, but it really should say placement. So just, just pretend that that typo is not there. Um, so the placement of the blade, not the brawn of the arm or the wrist. And you can really see if you look at his uh, beginning books where he talks about how you find that strength for your defense and your offense from where you put your sword and how it doesn't have to touch. And um, he goes through that a little bit. He talks about if you're fighting with a stronger opponent versus a weaker opponent in the first book. So he, he uses lots of instances where mechanical advantage can outplay uh, 
your strength advantages, um, which is often what people are doing when they're playing this pressure versus pressure game. Who's going to give first, right? And you just let that go, let their sword go offline. Um, and also he states in there um, a thing about measure or about tempo uh, where it and touching blade where every cavazioni executed after the opponent touches your sword uh, or your blade is dangerous and not performed in the correct tempo. So he is advocating in that part, you know, if an if opponent is going to touch your blade, you should already be getting out of the way and preventing touching um, of the blade. Uh, he, you know, uh, answer to a cavazione is a cavazione into your opponent. Um, so anytime an opponent goes to touch your blade in the way his theories work, um, is you should be repositioning your sword to find that greater advantage without retouching the blade because you are seeing it coming and you don't want to give away, you don't want to let him control, him or her control your angles um, and change your positioning. You want to control that positioning um, and go ahead and be on the offense of where you want to put your sword. So, um, and one way to do that is to prevent it from touching. So that is, that is the last of my quotes and I'm gonna hand it back over to Julian. All right, so now what I'm going to go into is talking about what some of the other masters in the Italian tradition um, talk about, uh, about the sense of touch and whether they encourage it or discourage it, especially in reference to counter guards. So I have a bunch of quotes and uh, we're just gonna jump right into them. So let's bring it up into the screen that I'm sharing. Okay, so I'm gonna start with uh, two manuals that very specifically come from the Fabris tradition right after it. And that's, uh, that's C13 and Vienna Anonymous. Um, so C13 and Vienna Anonymous both, uh, so Vienna Anonymous is really, an interpretation of a blend of Fabris and uh, and Capifero, and then C13 is really very quickly in their very quickly uh, in the wake of it, and argued the same. So, what we can see right here is uh, is the first quote is from C13, and once again they're talking about counter guards and counter postures. So the counter posture is a counter guard in which, with the help of the steps, you position your body and your blade in such that you are protected from the line that goes from your opponent's point to your body. We've already talked about this, denying that direct line. And you have occupied their weak with a little more iron or strength of your blade, which Letia talked about with the different, different points in your blade, without touching theirs, and it's highlighted right there, such that you are secured against their thrust with their point, without movement of either your body or your blade, and they are for forced to seek their advantage elsewhere, which prompts a disengage or prompts a changing of their body to change that to change that alignment or even them trying to actually engage your sword and wrestle it aside which Latia was just talking about with uh with if they try to touch your sword now now you've got all sorts of considerations that go into these different plays and are in plays throughout all the manuals the next one we're going to go into is uh is being anonymous and there are two places where I'm sure in in other places as well, but two specific places where um, where Vienna Anonymous talks about it. So um, the first one is where he talks about shutting down your opponent's sword. It's a big quote, but um, it's basically talking about how the first quote is about um, basically how to compose that compose that covering of your opponent's sword. It's used in lots of different ways, gaining. Um, finding is sometimes used in a, in a progression or sometimes it's used, uh, um, sometimes it's used uh, as, a, as a synonym. One problem with the general Italian tradition is that different masters use different words sometimes to mean different things. But that's something that also makes Vienna Anonymous a really valuable manual because the author talks about it and, uh, and does go really into a lot of detail about these different interpretations. So he's using shutting down your opponent's blade, which we can assume is gaining your opponent's sword. So it says, even though this may seem uh, very little, it is sufficient as shown in figure 30. This will make, uh, so move your sword without undue exertion, without moving nor flinging your sword, your arm as you shut your opponent's sword on a straight line toward their body with a little bit more of your fourth part of your, of, of your fourth part to your opponent's fourth, fourth part. So they're talking about a, 
a small difference in blade in blade difference, but such that you still have the mechanical advantage. Uh, that is about a span beyond his point, which is so a span is the the length of your of your hand extended. So you're talking about you're he's encouraging you to get your opponent's blade about here. I have a sword right here, so so about so uh, is where you're kind of wrestling them at. Um, or where you're trying to engage them, I shouldn't say wrestling because that implies touch. Uh, even though your opponent may seem little, it is sufficient as shown in figure 30, that, which is not referenced by the way. Um, this will make your sword considerably stronger so that your sword is stronger than his without even touching it and without leaning your blade on his, but keeping it as close as possible. Uh, this way, when a sword moves, you immediately move yours as if they were tied together. So in this case, being anonymous is interpreting it as a gaining your opponent's sword, finding and gaining your opponent's sword is done close, but not touching. Um, the second part is uh, he's talking about, uh, about advancing on your opponent. So always go forward with your forte at his double So with your strong, they're weak. Uh, while his sword is in, is in presence, which means that his sword is, is in, in the area between you. So if their sword is like way out over here, that's his blade's not in presence. Uh, after gaining your opponent's sword in this manner, immediately go forward without pausing between when you find his sword, when you go forward, glide along and follow his edge without touching it, um, which will bring your hilt to where you now have your point, your arm steady. So once again, Vienna Anonymous is interpreting this as not touching throughout the action. And we'll get to this when we talk to other masters, when we talk about other masters as well. So it's a throughout, it's denying that sense of touch throughout the action. Uh, Letia, do you have something to add? Yeah, I was gonna add, um, while we're on Vienna Anonymous, it is, you can all, you can pick out phrases and parts of um, his writing that are almost word for word in Fabris or word for word in different orders. So if you look at the two texts together, I mean, clearly they are very linked, but for those that haven't like read them kind of side by side, a lot of those phrases you'll see in both. And, and some of them are sentences that are very close to word to word. Um, so that's just something to look out for as you're reading through these in this, especially for this one. Yeah, just so anyone knows, if you if you're a big if you study Capoferro or you study Fabris, and if you study both, it's really worth your while to get a copy of Vienna Anonymous because it's it's basically someone who um, who studied who studied either with them or directly from those manuals in while they were all alive, and uh, and is directly interpreting it. So it's it's a really valuable vector for interpreting those specific manuals. Next, we're going to get into Capoferro. Um, so Capoferro is also of the no touch, uh, of the no touch fate, of the no touch kind of school of thought. Um, so you can see right here in chapter, uh, chapter 11, how to seek the measure. As far as gaining the sword, when I absolutely have to, as I am in guard seeking the measure, it is only necessary that I gain the opponent's debole with my forte in a straight line, placing my blade above his without touching it. Only when I strike should I push my forte against the opponent's debole uh, to the inside or outside, depending on the situation. So now, so that's that initial composition. The initial composition being a counter guard without touching. However, you're beginning to see where Capoferro talks about engaging, actually touching the blade as you execute the follow on action which you're going to see as a theme that goes on with later with some of the later masters throughout the 1600s. So that's a, uh, um, Letia, you have something to add there? Yeah, I was just going to point out um, the theories that I mentioned with Fabris before, the placing the blade above his um, starts to sh connect some of those strengths you see when they talk about, so a lot of times they're thrown in in these smaller places of how to make those strengths happen without actually touching the blade. So I just wanted to kind of highlight that connection back to the earlier um, talks about strengths. Awesome. Yeah, so you can, now, one thing I will also add about Capoferro is that there, there are schools that in, who know a lot about what they're doing that also, in, that don't necessarily follow that, the, uh, the, 
not touching um, idea uh, as much. Cause a lot, I think there's, there's something to be said that Capoferro techniques can work um, with, with touching as well. There's people that I know who, 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 who work that just fine, but um, it's, I wouldn't say it's probably as integral to a system as, as it is if you're really doing an orthodox Fabris uh, way of doing it. So next we're gonna go into Giganti. And this is something where hopefully we can give you something that you might not know if, uh, if you're working from the normal sources. So Giganti, uh, where um, one part where, he's, where he does talk about, about this, so when you're talking about uh, plates four and five, the initial plates of Giganti, the initial plays of Giganti um, are where he, he talks about what, especially what we're talking about, about creating a contraposture and then react and then um, provoking a disengage or, pro or and then basically turning your hand to make it. So you can see in part uh, plate five and I'm not quoting Leone and there's a reason for that. Um, so he says, uh, you learn from this figure that if your um, enemy should be in guard with the sword on the left side, high or low, go to constrain him from the outside path of his sword from the outside of measure with your sword above his so much that to scarcely touch him with a proper and strong footstep with your sword in action defense uh and wound with the quick eye now one thing that is really that i will talk about is that the most widely available copy of giganti in book form is the is the leone translation and it's it's a good translation in in large part however um this is what the quote on the screen is, is not what, how, uh, how Leone translates it. Leone translates it as saying, um, uh, to gain his blade from the, uh, to the outside from out of measure, barely resting your, your blade over his and standing over a solid stance. Now, that's a big difference between touch and over, and you see that in a lot of texts. However, if you go to the Italian, the actual Italian transcription of it, the word is, is, forgive my Italian, it's tocha or toca, where it's T-O-C-C-H-A. And so if you look at the, um, if you look at the Wittenauer translation, which is uh, a, a different one, um, the Wittenauer translation also translates it as touch and tocha means touch in Italian. And I think, and I'm not going, I don't know more Italian than, uh, than um, Leone does, but my guess is that he interpreted it that way in order to remain consistent with with what um, with what Fabris and uh, and Capoferro were doing. So good intention, but um, I would say most translators of Giganti do interpret him as advocating touch to a uh, light touch, I should say, scarcely touch him um, to the at least for the purposes of that play where you're gaining them to the outside. Uh, so there are differences in interpretation there, but if you look at the Italian, it does say touch. Uh, so, but lightly, and once again, that goes back into what we're talking about, about how a, a, an over-aggressive touch can mean that you, when they deny that, boom, you go offline. So yeah, you don't want that. Pretty much regardless, I don't think there's anyone that, that wants that. Um, as far as the uh, as far as the masters talk about. Um, next, we're going to talk about Dolciolini a little bit. Dolciolini is a little bit lesser known. It doesn't have the pretty pictures that the other that the uh, that a lot of the other uh, Italian masters do. But um, you can see in red right here that uh, when he's talking about the counter guards, uh, so it says the, if the point of the opponent's sword is angled to the right, then you should take it to the outside to uh, on this side. Um, once again, he's talking about forming a counter guard. This will give you the opportunity to enter without your opponent being able to attack and strike his right and uh, and to strike his right shoulder as follows. So he's talking about Dolciolini likes to attack the right shoulder, by the way, which is their sword shoulder. Um, so your true edge should slide along your opponent's sword, thus moving his sword away from the punto, punto meaning the target area, um, with your sword moving uh, to strike the point of the right shoulder. And this is where you really start to see uh, masters explicitly saying to maintain that blade contact throughout the action. And this is, it kind of is a little bit in keeping with what Capoferro said about um, pushing your opponent's sword through that, through that action. Um, and that slide, once again, explicitly different than what uh, Vienna Amos said about not touching them as you go in. Dolce is saying, do touch them and push them aside. 
so now, so like I said, as we continue on into the 1600s, we begin to see a little bit of differences in thought. Uh, and this is going to lead us right into actually one of my favorite interpretations of this. Uh, and not, this, not because I, that's how I like to do it, but because it creates a composed uh, system of this. And that is Kulpa. Uh, and once again, I don't speak German, so I apologize if I'm, if I'm saying that wrong. But Kulpa has a, uh, a whole big uh, place in it. And you, can, you might be able to, uh, I'm going to try to zoom in on my screen here so maybe you can see it a little bit clearer. All right, so he's talking about, uh, they call it ligurin. So ligurin or binding, and this might take a second, but it's, it's really worth it because this is, it's, it, it frames this as a whole different idea. So ligurin or binding is one such motion by which you come to the enemy's blade and by which you seek and make the beginning of your advantage. He's talking about counter guards. Um, and it is the application of your blade onto that of the enemy so that you either touch the blade of the enemy from above or below or else merely come near it and hold your blade either above or below the blade of the enemy from which you can come further into the measure once the enemy moves. So he's talking about creating counter guard as you come in closer and create a, a, a closer measure between you. Engaging, however, is a motion and application of the blade to the to the opponent's blade, to the enemy's blade, in such a manner that you push onto the enemy's blade somewhat, as it were, and strike along it toward the enemy, uh, so that with this engaging, you may and can obtain advantage of the measure uh, over the enemy. But this is the difference between binding and engaging, that in binding, after you have caught the enemy's blade with your point and make something of a stop to look and await what the enemy is minded to do. Uh, but in engaging, do not hold back, but strike and move with your blade toward the enemy. Okay, so to either provoke or uh, to provoke your enemy to move. So that's all some tactical stuff, but this is where he talks explicitly about touch. Then in binding, it is not always necessary to touch the enemy's blade. Rather, it is often enough to be above, below, or next to the enemy's blade or weapon. But in engaging, you must always touch the enemy's blade and weapon. So Copa presents this as a choice in the in the counter guard of of touching or not touching, but he says you can do this without touching. And once again, as you see some of these masters saying that as you uh, compose the attack, as you actually execute that attack, then you are touching. Uh, your your uh, you mu you must always touch the enemy's blade and weapon. Once again, this is not what Fabris is saying. I'm presenting this as, as a as a as what some other masters say in the tradition, not necessarily in the opposite tradition, but in the Italian tradition as continued on into Germany and other countries as it became popular. So that's kind of uh, Coppa's interpretation of it. But it's really cool because he he uh, he's very explicit in how he does it. He's not really mincing words here, and that could also be. Uh, uh, that could also be a just general compliment to uh, to Reiner Van Nort, just doing a really good job of being a translator. So, uh, uh, Bruchius, uh, who is a who is a Dutch um, who is a Dutch master in the same in the same tradition and in the same time period, uh, also talks about Ligurin, uh, but it's not as it's not as uh, it's not really explicit. So I just included it in the Copa uh, slide right here. It says this means. Uh, so much as seizing your opponent's blade with a half circle, be it on the inside or the outside of the body. With this, the underthrusts are, are mainly parried. So it, it does give a little, another vector for this is what Ligurin is, and it's kind of a synonym for, uh, for, um, for a counter guard with covering. Um, with Palbicini, so Palbicini is, uh, and we're going to talk about Palbicini, uh, Bondi Damaso, and Marcelli, and that's going to be my how I'm going to close out these masters. Uh, Palavicini, Bonnie Damaso, and Marcelli are all later 1600s uh, masters. And these are, this is when you start to get very different traditions. Um, maybe not very, but with a lot of the, you know, kind of frog DNA of, uh, or actual explicit lineage from the earlier Italian masters, but they, but they take it in different directions and directions that maybe you can see similarities to in small sword fencing or even modern sport fencing. So you can see Palavicini, he, uh, says, uh, and how the sword is found, chapter 13, uh, in the event that in touching your, the opponent's sword on the inside and out of measure, he made a cavazione at the moment you engaged your sword to his, 
uh, with the turn of the hand to Sekondo, you wound him in the chest. Basically, he's talking about um, he's talking uh, about uh, Giganti plate five, plate four. He's talking about Giganti plate four. Really, it's it's pretty much the same thing, except in this case, um, he is he doesn't say in the earlier part of the text that um, that the counter guard is formed. He doesn't explicitly say that it's formed uh, with with touch, but he does say um, he you can see you can in interpreting this quote when he says in touching the opponent's sword. Uh, he made a cavazione at the moment you engage your sword. He's basically kind of implying that that the engagement was a touch. Um, so that's so. In interpreting this, you can see that Palavicini is not necessarily anti-touch, or at least for the purposes of this scenario, he isn't. Uh, quote's neat because it's almost a direct opposition to the quote of Fabris, where he says, "If your opponent has a chance to touch your blade, your tempo is too slow." So they're they're almost diametrically opposed. Yeah. All right, and then uh, Bonnie DiMazzo, I don't have the whole thing uh, on here uh, because it's, it's kind of long and it's kind of complicated, but he says, um, when, he's, uh, when he's talking about gaining, um, so you're, let's see, that's, if you have the Bonnie DiMazzo translation by Swanger, Lanza, Van Newert, and Butera, which is here if you can see my screen, if you can see me besides my screen, um, the uh, he there's a series of plates about gaining, and he says uh, when your opponent approaches to engage your blade, you should disengage before he touches it, uh, with before he touches it with his own and deliver a thrust. The opponent's blade will not find a resting place and thus will fall a bit. Meanwhile, your attack will proceed either to one side or the other, and this kind of ties into the tactical considerations that I talked about earlier, where. Uh, your, if you deny your opponent that sense of touch, um, you can be on the advantage. So what, what, um, what Bondi DiMazzo is talking about here is against the opponent that is trying to touch you. If you deny them that sense of touch, they might overcommit with their blade and you are in the advantage because now you are the, the, the person who's, who has the offensive, you have the initiative and they will react slower to that blade change, to that change of relationship because you have denied them the sense of touch and they're relying on a slower sense of, a, of a slower visual sense. Um, and finally, we're gonna go to uh, Marcelli and we have about 15 minutes left of the, of this time block. So I think I have enough time to at least a little bit talk about this. I have my, Marcelli right here. Okay. Uh, Marcelli used a lot, uses lots of flower, lots of flowery and detailed language. Sometimes Mar there's, uh, what is it? So David Koblenz, uh, Master David in Meridis is a huge Marcelli guy. He's awesome if you want to learn about Marcelli from him. Uh, so, um, but uh, he's, he, I think he's a little more patient than I am. Uh, so, so when he says, uh, he uses lots of Term. So he says, the game must begin with softness and without bravado, not an imitation of some who seem that they want to devour the opponent in an instant. They run close, jump with the feet, give a stick blow with the sword. Uh, so let's see. Therefore, it must begin little with firmness, endeavoring to place the point of his sword over the opponents as, uh, as the aforesaid Cavalier Five has done, who has first brought his weak over his opponent's same weak. So he uses lots of like kind of, you know, done not with, you know, done with, uh, with, uh, uh, with softness and, um, and little by little with firmness. Now that could imply a little bit of, of, of a sense of touch, but as we've seen earlier, um, that could also just mean being assertive or being, you know, carefully assertive in doing it, maybe denying your opponent's sense of touch. So we really don't know exactly what Marcelli says. Maybe David's gonna message me and saying, "No, you're you're wrong, Julian. Shut the fuck up. Uh, don't talk about a master you don't know about." But uh, but um, Marcelli really doesn't make it as explicit. So just to kind of recap, what we see from these masters is that not all of them agree on how to do this. They are masters, and we can we can only assume that they know what the hell they're talking about. Uh, but um, you can especially see when we're talking about Fabers, when we're talking about Capifera, when we're talking about Vienna Anonymous, interpreting them. Um, generally, they they ad advise being judicious, if not wholly denying your opponent the sense of touch. 
And then as you get into the maybe faster, maybe systems that correspond with lighter rapiers that maybe have more in common with small sword fencing and, uh, and, and modern fencing toward the end of the 1600s, they become a little bit more favorable about the, uh, about the sense of touch. And um, I'm going to let, let Tia close it up, but kind of my conclusion about all this is that you need to know, is that it's good to know why you're doing it and to know the factors at play. And that's how, that's how for me, that uh, the reaction times really fit into it, is what am I trying to achieve? If I am on the offensive, uh, if I'm maintaining the initiative, denying my opponent a sense of touch uh, denies them, a, uh, makes them, puts them at a slower reaction time than if I do give them the sense of touch. Um, but, so it's, it, it, can be, it can be used judiciously, but sometimes a sense of touch can work to your advantage if you are reacting to your opponent. So uh, I'm gonna hand this over to Ladia to, to kind of close this out, maybe have a, have a little bit further discussion. So uh, Letia, back over to you. So um, I did want to have you know that there's a question for you, Julian, in the chat. So take a look at that. And I'm just gonna say all the other masters that say you can touch a blade is wrong because I just really like Fabris. So like the rest of them are wrong. Um, but uh, you will know like even all of the examples, they still use the same blade mechanics. So none of them suggest you should like brutally fight the blade. They all say gentle and touch. So I just wanted to re-emphasize while some of these wrong masters may think you can touch a blade, they still all use the same overall theory and mechanics of blade angulation and control and strength comes from positioning overall, even if they do say you can judiciously, wrongly they say you can judiciously touch the blade. So um, I'm gonna see if Julian wants to answer the he looks like he answered the question in the chat. Yeah, so Robin, I'm I'm sending you some links. Uh, I'll be honest, I did not. I spent about ten minutes just googling reaction times by sense, and and uh, this is some of, just really some of what I got. Um, but it's it's there seems to be a general a general consensus that that the uh, that the sense of your sense of um your sense of uh, sight is a slower reaction time. And then your sense of then your sense of touch and then your sense of um, your sense of uh, hearing uh, is actually faster than than the sense of touch. Although I'm not sure if that's as uh, as as tested or or all that stuff. However, one thing that can come into it with senses is that uh, your senses also interface with um, with uh, with uh, forming um, with forming muscle memory and forming kind of habits where uh, where. Um, in the in the competitive shooting community, uh, you when it's shooting steel because um, you get that immediate sense of sound. You know that hey, I've hit the target versus um, you know I, I get that immediate that immediate feedback versus if I'm just shooting paper, I might have to walk up to the target to realize whether it was successful or not. Um, but that's kind of a different a different um, a different thing. But uh, but you know your your senses and the priority of your senses and what what how your senses create muscle memory and how they create reaction time uh can can really interface with some of this stuff but that's like that's deeper science uh there's actually a really fun kids game you can do to kind of like look at your reaction times as far as touch versus sight have you guys ever done the thing where you like you tap hands and like you're trying to hit the person's hand on top and if you do small taps and whatnot um if you were just to hold it here, immediately they're going to know to to jerk their hand away. But the little taps mean that they don't actually know when that hit is happening, and you can't actually see it as quickly as if you were just pushing it down. So this this uh, kind of sensory of not knowing when the touch is coming is actually faster than seeing that flip over. So if you guys want to kind of play with the how no touch. Or, or how reaction times can work versus in that thing, just find a friend. I know it's harder to find a friend right now sometimes. Some of us have friends at home, some of us don't. Um, but trying that little kid game can be, and thinking about it, how fencing can work and how that could relate to your sword would be a fun way to interact into these concepts. 
All right, so uh, so um, if it's okay with you, Latia, I think we can op open up to the group. If anyone, uh, let's see, looks like we have a question on the on the chat. So, uh, what about uh, <laughs> uh, why do you think there was such a fundamental shift as the centuries moved uh, on from blade contact to no blade contact to some blade contact? Uh, change in the type of sword, ease of, te ease of teaching, success, all of the above. Um, so there's definitely some different some different considerations, uh, and so I. I we we still I would argue we probably still only have a a a small subsection of of um, of the greater number of manuals that were that were published. You know we're just looking at the ones that we found that maybe some obsessive book collector kept. Um, so um, drawing overall trends some can sometimes be a little challenging uh, when when we're looking at manuals. But we got what we got, and we have to interpret from what we have. But um, I would say that there's a couple factors at play. One is lighter swords. Lighter swords is a uh, is is uh, is maybe can can change that. Um, the uh, so you've got lighter swords. You've got a trend against. Uh, uh, that toward especially the end of the 1600s uh a paired dagger isn't as common isn't as a uh, isn't as in vogue um more towards single sword fencing um another thing that a lot of times people don't talk about as much is the uh is um the is protective equipment and uh and the availability of protective equipment which which also changes how you can um what you can safely practice and what you can't safely practice uh, I would argue that um, that some of that a lot of the blade review stuff, stuff that relies on uh, fencing, that relies on just like you know moving fast uh, and and not using blade contact, is also something that you really can't. Uh, I mean, so I, sorry, I should say um, fencing that doesn't rely as much on um, closing lines and counter postures is something that you can't really safely practice without um, without having good fencing equipment. Uh, that you know that when you're having you can practice a a form of um, you can practice uh, counter postures and finding and gaining with arguably I could take two sharp rapiers and as long as me and my opponent are moving slowly we can still get that we can still get the general basis of that um, whereas if I'm doing a uh, blade refused um, fast fast uh fast fencing that doesn't rely on that stuff i really can't practice that um uh without but that's that's kind of a, a digression uh but i would say it's just different maybe think maybe popularity of styles but i would say faster swords faster maybe some maybe a little bit of a a uh, faster um more athletic arguably maybe more and a more athletic fencing style i so would I'd also think Having having mostly just looked at fabrics, so so I could be totally off base, but a lot of the earlier fighting seems to also be more cut heavy than thrust heavy, and the thrust is kind of because thrusts are faster there, and, and you can still even though as as long as you have that line, even though the blade is stronger, as long as you maintain that line, the thrust is faster. It's going to hit first. So um, when you're doing more cut oriented things blade contact can make more sense because you can angle off of those motions and, and use your opponent's force and use that into a cut. When you're mostly doing a thrust, that speed is more important than using your opponent's force to redirect. You want to have all the angle control as opposed to stealing off their force and and using those motions would be my other my other thought having having very little uh looking into uh cut and thrust but um or into cuts uh but fabris directly says that like cuts are slower you know these are all the thrusts to do against it here's some a couple cuts to work with but mostly i think that would play into that as well Anyone have any other questions? Anything they want to talk about? All right. Well, hey, uh, we really appreciate you all showing up and uh, and coming to class. It's actually more people than I expected. So so you all were awesome, and thank you for coming to this. Uh, we will post um, some of these documents on the event page. Uh, following this, I will um, move this recording to uh, to um, to uh, YouTube um, to my to my um, my youtube channel that i share with the uh the um the barony from my last uh from the outlands 
and uh and yeah so hey i really appreciate it and you all are welcome to contact uh uh contact me contact ledia with any questions this um and uh this is going to be a weekly thing um on wednesday on wednesday lunches eastern time so a lot earlier western time i'm sorry uh um for the next uh five weeks after this so. yeah, thank, thank everybody very much for being here y'all are awesome thank you Bye, everybody. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank you.